Hey everybody. So can you imagine for hours and hours and hours, 
first theory out of ceiling. Uh, and um, the, the next step that we're, we're pushing towards in terms of VR capability is, um, and, and actually you know, Meta's going this direction too with the next release, to have eye tracking capability. So that um, at least initially, and again like I say, they kind of all piece and part one another. Uh, to have um, the ability to um, basically leave the room that you're trapped in and, and your body that you're trapped in and actually visit, um, visit the world, right? Uh, whether it's a virtual world or a real world. And you'll see more and more, um, uh, there's more and more apps that right now that can actually visit places online and see them in real time. So that's sort of the next step in terms of, you know, it, with locked in patients is to build a VR capability that they can actually, you know, go forward and, and leave sort of locked in situations, at least as best as they can. Um, uh, and I guess, instead of just like smart infrastructure and things, we, we talked a little bit um, about smart roads. Um, and the, the bridge in California will actually uh, have the capability to detect overweight vehicles and speeds of vehicles as well. Uh, and one of the things we're working towards now is a pilot project um, to um, work on EV dynamic charging, so uh, charge while you drive. Uh, and um, we hope to announce something relatively soon in terms of like first deployment, or the first attempt at <laughs> getting uh, a, a smart road that can actually charge a vehicle. Um, so, so again, the, if there's a lot of bits and pieces, but really the end game is, uh, again, how, you know, how people are interacting within that smart city is really how smart is it, or how much does it really improve your life um, if you're not part of that system? Uh, and like I said, it could be an intermediary or you know, have a brain chip in your head. Uh, but, um, but I mean, that's the ultimate goal is in improving, again, the human condition. Uh, and then what do we do with all of this data? Uh, and uh, I like to think of us really as a data company, data acquisition company. Uh, and then from there, um, the multiple applications uh, using data as a foundation as well. So, um, similar to like what Google kind of does, right? For data. Um, I guess I'll hold there. I, you know, we weren't, usually we, we don't, um, it's very difficult to do question and answer, but we set mics up. And um, I want to just take a, a section of time where uh, you guys can ask me almost anything. Anything I can answer that's not uh, non public information, but um, um, I think we have a, a, a walking mic, so we can turn on somewhere. We'll leave in a second. So if you, if you guys want to ask, um, again, there's some things obviously I can't, I can't say, um, but, um, but I'll try my best to answer. And um, we'll go to from there. I'll actually sit down, because maybe you have a question for this guy, or, or maybe for Dr. Phil. <laughs> Not yet, not yet. Yeah, question. Um, so, as far as getting the data, um, what would you want to use the data for later? Like, because you can perform the bridges later and maybe use data previously to build a better bridge, or what are the future ventures for that? Yeah, uh, so great question. I'm, I'm glad you referred back to the bridge. <clears throat> um, I, I, and I'll, I'll also mention too, in terms of when the bridge, the ribbon cutting on the bridge, we'll call it, uh, it looks like the end of December. That's an estimate from Caltrans. We, we don't have really any control over when they can finish. <clears throat> what we've been doing is actually collecting data in the sections as they get installed. And then ultimately, uh, when they decide that it's going to go live, the whole bridge will go live. So, so we'll give you guys in terms of when that's going to happen. Uh, but that, with respect to the data, so it, it, again, it's kind of, because we're at day one, right? So we turn the bridge on, we're collecting data 24 7. Things like stress and strain, but also like uh, torsions on the bridge. Like uh, something I learned while we're in this project is as the, the sun tracks ac across the bridge, the bridge actually torsions and twists because certain areas heat and certain areas are cooler. So you have, you have all this real-time data, and again, let, let's say there's an earth movement or, you know, um, like a flooding condition. Um, all that data is stored, and then it will have um, kind of like a little slider uh, where you could slide uh, along and actually see what that bridge is doing over each year. 
Um, and then do like max min in terms of stress strain and temperature, the kinds of things. And then that, that data, the plan is not just bridge data, but all the infrastructure data, to have into a database, and then ultimately create a drag and drop type of program where, let's say, a bridge engineer can drag and drop components into a screen. And um, the bridge you're building would remain green, meaning it's within limits. Uh, and each piece of part that you drop in there is tagged with the real world data. Right now, it's calculations. There's nothing wrong with that. But what, as an engineer, what's the preference to, to put in you know, a, a steel girder that has 20 years of real world technology or the data collected behind it? And drop that in the bridge or do a mathematical calculation and maybe not be accurate or as accurate as you could be. So, and then year by year, the more data you collect from different areas of the world, each time, each new iteration of a bridge improves over and over and over. Uh, so, so that's that's the idea of collecting the data from all infrastructure, pipelines, um, aircraft wings as well too, and carbon fiber. We can uh, we can detect changes in carbon. So it's just how do we constantly improve buildings, construction, road construction, bridges, like you name it. How do we improve that? And, and collecting data now from day one, I mean, it seems like a long way out, but it's really not. Uh, and in the very first, you know, the very beginning of time now, like we'll call it day, day one, um, you're already monitoring for you know, conditions that could cause that piece of infrastructure to fail, maybe injure or kill somebody, right? So, so the first thing is we're preventing those kinds of things. And then we're using that data in the systems constantly learning. Um, and again, so it's the hot word people like to use is big data as a service. Uh, and that's really one of the things that we provide other than actually installing systems uh, into infrastructure. So hopefully that answered that. That was a long answer, sorry. I'll try to keep them really short. Anybody else? Can I ask also if you want to talk about Kennedy or my friend Craig here? Yeah. All right, so I was hoping y'all didn't pick me. That is, I love you. I, I really think that you have a great stock. Um, I'm invested in pretty much all that I ever have. Um, So, are we doing this or are we not? So, what I mean by that, uh, I'm being put on the spot. Um, are we going to Optimon? So, I have over 4 million plus shares. I'm, I'm losing everything. I was betting on that I'm getting off on shares because they're doing whatever, X. Can you answer me that? And I've, I know you know me when you go on your email. Being humbled, can you please give me an answer? on where my investment's gone. Sorry. Um, so it's, it's kind of vague. I don't know if I fully understand. You, you, you're asking about Alphalon. What question? I, I'm not really sure what you're asking. Sorry. I've invested X amount. You said you were doing this. Without trying to sound like I'm not believing in you, but I, so I believe in you. That's fine. But I've got so much shares, and I know you're ex cop, pilot, whatever, and everybody bashing you. I've been there with you. I'm starting to feel like it's getting to the point where, like, we, we don't know what we're doing anymore. Well, that's, that's not the case. I, I mean, I understand what you're saying, because uh, I, I, I guess I kind of understand the confusion in terms of 
because the question was about why the brains now. Yeah. Um, but again, it's not about the brains, it's about data and where we want to go forward with the data. Um, but you mentioned something about Alphalon too, which I, I, I'm not sure of the connection, but um, there's not much you can talk about because I don't know if you referred to the IPO that we talked about, which we, we can't talk again so much about it because it's a gun jumping rule that the SEC would shut it down. If, if we were to go forward with an IPO, I have to preface with that. The, the SEC would shut it down if we started talking about IPO. Um, and, and, and PRs that were put out, they are highly, highly regulated that what we had put in, what we couldn't put in. So, so even just the draft of the, um, of, of the PR is actually guided by the SEC. Okay, I, I, so I guess I'll put it out in a serious way when everyone wants to hear. What are the shares of Optalon per our Dark Pulse shares? That, that's another thing we can't talk about with the SEC. Um, I'm trying to think how I can even how I can answer it. It's um, so I mean it's in process. I can tell you that. I, I can tell you part of the process is going to include um, an audit, uh, a U.S. audit, because the other part of the process is there's an S1 filing that has to be done. So uh, Apollon is in the U.K. It's IFRS, and that has to be converted to GAAP. <clears throat> which takes time. Uh, and um, there's more than one thing sort of going on, and I, I, don't, I don't want to allude to really any, like much, because again, again, it's a problem with uh, in terms of what's public, what's non public. Uh, and so my hands are tied a lot of the times. Uh, so it's not about that something's not happening or not going on. It's um, there's certain things that we're focused on, a lot of things, but. The main thing is we, in terms of updating, it's very difficult what you're going to say or what you can't say. So it's I, just easier to, to err on the side of the question. To, totally appreciate that. Totally appreciate where you're from doing the same thing. Um, when you said that you were, I'm going to give X amount of shares of Optima per DPLS. We still don't know where we're at. Yeah, because we can't give you that number yet. But that's supposed to be out per your S1, whatever it was, 8K. No, S1 is the following. Believe me, I'm invested in you. I, I've got way more than money in shows. It's easier for, to talk offline than talk about the same topic. I'd say someone asked us the question, and you and I can discuss it. Okay. In terms of the ratio, I can't sit up here and give you a ratio. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Not, not to cut you off, I just I can't sit here and say the ratio will be this. It's yeah. extremely complicated in terms of how that ratio is. You know, market cap. There's a million things that the link to what the ratio will be. And you know, someone emailed me that too. My my answer was, you know. They're free shares. It's, you know, everything, hang, hang in there, kind of thing. Uh, we're doing everything we can. Uh, I'm always going to do the right thing. Whether, I mean, there's rules that, to, that you have to do the right thing, but I'll always do the right thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, you got to have a little bit of. Let, this, let some things roll forward and things shake out a bit, and I think you'll, the answer will come to um, relatively soon. I mean, that's the best way to do. It. I can't, I can't give dates. It's, uh, it's against. I'm still with you. No, that's fine. Yeah, and you know, I, I appreciate it. I'm not saying you know, I'm still talking about but um, but I appreciate what you. Yeah, you're right. I'm a New York brother. I've been with you forever. Well, and, and, you know, and it's, and, and it's everybody. I understand everyone, you know. Um, but you know, East Coast is the best coast. There you go. We're trying anyway. Um, but anyway, you know, we made a, we we made huge strides. Craig talked about it um, in terms of revenue and the amount of contracts they signed versus last year. I mean, you mentioned the focus because um, originally the focus for Alphalon was large contracts. Um, and uh, those things take a you know, number of years to actually work through uh, contracts that we shifted the focus to the one to three million size. 
there's no saying a month's different. Wow. Like, like, six months or something like that. Um, so we're doing everything we can, uh, you know, in terms of bringing in revenue. And, and I'll mention, we, we talked a little bit in the, in the launches of that, that um, the original focus, again, for a newer company, um, to me, made sense to be um, focused on market share uh, and capability and build more of the foundational stuff, you know, versus, um, I didn't say versus revenue, but what it is is in order to buy a high revenue company, you need a lot of money. So you can't buy a non revenue producing uh, company. You would, you would buy that for a lot of money, and that's why the attraction was awful long. But you have to look at what's the foundational stuff they brought. It took us into 11 countries. Um, their revenues brought us from zero revenues to roughly 14 million in revenues, almost overnight, right? Uh, and, uh, and then the capabilities in terms of engineering. So I have to make decisions based on the amount of money we have, and then what is it going to bring to us as shareholders and the company? Uh, and it brought capability and market share, right? So there's capability and market share multiple times, like uh, again with um, like with the drone companies, another example, and things like that. So. Um, and then, you know, the shift becomes, and again, as you have access to better capital, um, is to look at companies that are producing revenue, and then the focus becomes, still, what's the ancillary, or what other kind of capabilities come to the, com to the company? What kind of market share comes to the company? Um, uh, and, uh, and then, you know, of course, uh, I was going to say better companies, but companies with, you know, positive uh, cash flows, uh, you're in a better position actually to buy stuff. Then you focus on the positive cash flow type of entities, uh, but you also look at the capabilities of market share. Uh, and it's really interesting, uh, Jeff Bezos, very similar. Um, he had, I mean, they lost money for 20 something years, um, but he understood the position of being a market leader, and that's what I'm trying to position us for, to be a market leader. Um, you look at things like, um, but, um, well, Intel um, made a comment saying the, the industrial metaverse. They're moving into the industrial metaverse. And I thought, well, that's great, but we already launched the industrial metaverse last weekend in DC with our VR headset. So we're, we moved first, see? And these are, the, these are the things that I'm looking to do, to always be able to move first. Uh, and um, again, while well, it might, you know, to your point, like, you know, what, what things are doing what. Uh, there's a greater plan in there, you see. And they all, they all kind of link it together. And I was trying to describe it best as saying, um, to think of the data and what, what we can do with the data going forward. And, and really, you know, again, uh, I guess it's say being a data company, but um, you have to be careful where you hang your hat. So like I say in the next 10 years, what's the next big thing that everybody's interested in? What if it's not infrastructure and you're, you know, Joe's infrastructure, and, uh, you go to the wayside, right? So, so it's looking at key markets and markets that I think we can move into and markets that have um, large um, capacity for revenue. And then how does that all kind of interlock together? So that's kind of where, where we're working on what I'm thinking. That was a long one, sorry. That was a good one. I'm trying to check some of the boxes off for you guys to have all the answers. So, my question is for Dr. Hugh. Um, I guess I didn't Dr. Hugh. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Hard for me to hear you a little bit, sorry. Uh, so, Dr. Phil, I'm wondering, will there be a less invasive way of inserting the chip? Yes, there are less invasive techniques. Um, so, the chip is one, where you put electrodes all over your head, you can work with cyclists. Um, the resolution is really low. So, we compensate that by using sophisticated computer techniques. Um, you can go underneath the skin to the what we call the ECOG uh, from the cytography, and that is higher resolution. But again, they combine those with uh, sophisticated computer programs. Um, 
for speech, and fine finger movements. You need higher resolution than that. And <clears throat> I published a paper that came out in Frontiers recently showing that, that the people that put electrodes in there after a few months or years have to use multiple multi multi units. In other words, not just one single unit, which is the highest resolution, but multiple units. And again, they don't get the resolution they don't get. Well, I and maybe say Elon Musk, he actually believes in single units because he knows it's the highest resolution. The problem with this electrode is metal tip and it's not going to last. Not going to last the life of the patient. But not to run it down, but all those techniques you have revealed lots and lots of good data. And we understand more about how the brain works. So it's a long way from being understanding how the movie does work. But still, as to the knowledge base. So, um, a lot of people obviously want to do non-invasive recording um, and even non-invasive stimulation, which you can do with transmagnetic stimulation and electrical stimulation of the answer. But, um, so, the reason that I focus and continue to focus on the high resolution is because you get more information. And the other thing that we were talking about is that um, you can actually train the brain. Remember the first video with Eric and Mike my head? I trained him to fire, I mean that wasn't the first time we tried, it was just on the video, okay? But I trained him to fire that single unit and produce data. Right? So you can train the brain. And recently I published data showing that you really can. And it's it's not in the book, by the way, but uh, the, uh, if you go to the website, uh, I will put the reference in there. So the fact that you can train single units, which is different than training not, you know, low resolution signals from the surface of the meat is hugely powerful. So if you get a lot of single units, and some of them have nothing to do with speech, you can train them to have something to do with speech. So you can see the power of that technique. The problem is that when you put kind of inputs in, they'll sharp ends in, the brain hates that, and will, you will eventually lose the signal. But if they get great signals initially, and they can use that to learn about the brain. But it just is not good enough for long term. It's good enough for short term. But you can't take somebody who's paralyzed, like a 20 year old, who has an accident, and breaks his neck, and infects the brain stem, and tell them, oh, we'll do this for five years, and then end and see them well afterwards. That's not okay. That's not okay. So you've got to be able to have something that you can show data, not just talk, not just smoke. You show the data that it is yours. And uh, we think we've got that. And that's where we add value to darkness. Because you know, we talked about the metaverse, etc. And you need to control, control yourself within the metaverse. But we change the lives of these people. And it's not only that, when we eventually start complaining humans that are so called. But um, <laughs> so when we start playing people like that, um, that's a whole new point. Again, it brings up, which I'll mention now, it brings up ethical problems there. Because you see that you make something more powerful than your neighbor, and governments will want those, and they want them. They say, no, that's wrong. What you have to do is make it available for everyone. I use the analogy of the cell phone. Like 10, 20 years ago, it was a big chunky thing. It was very expensive and very few people had it. Now, hands up, anybody doesn't have a cell phone. See, there are no hands. So everybody has one, maybe, maybe a cheap one, a cheap one, maybe a fancy apple for a thousand dollars or something. So in other words, the technology should be available for everyone.
unheard of, at least at first. And now, I mean, you, you get in and out of the procedure in a day or two. Um, so again, we, we're, we're, we're in the perspective of today, so it's very hard to comprehend and understand that why would someone want to do this? But you have to understand as, as the technology progresses, it becomes a second nature type of thing to have this technology. And then also look at, so there's focus in the medical first, where, you know, speech restoration and then movement and perhaps walking and paraplegics, right? Um, then there's human performance aspect. Everybody wants it. We all go to the gym, we all try different diets, we're all fasting now, right? Um, when you start seeing the capability, especially if you, if you look at the joint venture agreement, the, the, the patents that are in there, that Phil has patented, or patents that are pending, um, there's internet um, and, um, and cell phone access in that chip as well, too. So, yeah, it, it is being, that you would create a very powerful individual, but then, you temper that by having access to the tech, so everybody has access and wants it. But then you go on the other side of the point where we're talking about AI, and AI being unchecked, and, and the, the answer that's that sort of proposed is that AI is also sort of open, uh, you know, open source, so open AI is one of the companies, right? But the reality is, are the governments that are gonna be completely open with what they're working on, or will they take, if it's open to the public, open source, take that and then do their own iteration of it? So how do you counterbalance that too? And again, this is sort of, you know, gears out, future out. But it would be to enhance humans at the same sort of rate you try to enhance humans, or at least have the ability to be enhanced to compete with what AI might bring. So there's like a lot of different ways to look at it. And, you know, again, we can kind of future us a bit, but, um, you know, if, if, again, if we look at today, it's, it's about restoring speech and then helping, you know, movement is another thing, not so much a focus because there's a lot of camps out there. But the way that um, Dr. Kennedy's been working is to have more natural human type movements in terms of um, you know, like robotic arms and, and robotic limbs versus very shaky robot looking moves. Somebody mentioned to me, uh, like, oh, it's already being done, there's a video of a woman drinking with a robotic arm. So I watched it and it, it looks like a robot. And then she can only bring the model up, and then she has to try to grab the straw with her mouth. Uh, so that's fine now, but again, it's the sort of the way that Phil collects the data um, that would be anticipated a more streamlined process, and to actually there to drink, you know, things like that. So, so again, a lot out there, a lot to sort of take in. Uh, but I just wanted to comment in terms of you know, you know how things move forward, uh, and uh, how do you go from today? Because again, you are. Our perspective today is today, if you went back a hundred years to somebody, you know, and said, um, you know, you want to, you want someone to take a, a selfie with you a hundred years ago, they would not understand what they're talking about, right? Um, and if you went back 10,000 years and you visited a guy that lived in a cave, what would you ask him for? You know, it'd be really great if I keep this fire running 24 hours a day, right? <laughs> He's not going to say, oh, I could use a cell phone and call so-and-so in the next village, right? So, so again, we're kind of in that bubble right now. We're in, we're in 2020, what, 2022? Come on, Jack. So, so our perspective is today, uh, not 10 years from now. And then looking back again, you know, you know hindsight's always 2020. We actually give out the hindsight award at Dark Pulse, just so you know. And, um, but yeah, so it's just really exciting things going forward in, in the fall. You know, again, it might be like, hey, so it's disconnected. I don't understand what this is. Uh, we have all had the perspective of the cave person, where the, their, their thing is, how do I keep myself warm? And maybe how do I get some food in here versus, you know, but it's good use of to do some electricity in this cave and some heat, you know, things like that. So, anyway, so I'm sorry. I'll let you ask your question. I'll shut up. Yeah, that's all good. Yeah. I'm sure they'd be happy if you put dark pulse sensors in front of the cave so they knew when dinosaurs were coming. <laughs> but um, yeah. I'm Ben, long time listener, first time caller, old actor on soft twits, whatever. You know, um, a lot of us twits and Twitter followers uh, who have been watching you for a while now noticed a few months ago you mentioned something about the DST logo and its colors and to keep an eye on it for when it did change colors and that was supposed to mean something. So we did notice, 
that has changed colors since then, and we're kind of curious about what it meant. It's actually kind of funny because I don't think I'm saying that. Uh, it depends on what time it was. In my head, that would be said that already. Oh, yeah, that's fine. It might have been a mushroom experience for me. Um, yeah, I, I have no idea. Um, I don't, I don't, he didn't come here, but there's a guy that posts online, Next Gen. You guys remember him? He has like, all these videos. He did like really cool videos. And um, so I, I reached out to him and I said, hey, can we use this one video that you made in DC? And he was like, yeah, you can use anything you want. And then, not even 10 minutes later, I hope you're watching, um, he sends me a, a new video that he cranked yeah. out, and then we used it in, in DC. It was, it was awesome. Uh, and it was kind of the same thing. Like, I, I, was, I was bored with the, the, the logo we had, honestly, and, um, and then he reached out to him and was like, hey, try this. And then everyone he sent was a little bit better. I was like, oh great, now I gotta decide on another one. Uh, anyway, so yeah, I don't know, it just looked cool and I don't know. I just kinda of like the urge to mess around with that a little bit. Somebody probably commented about GSD and, and the light bulb went off. Uh, but anyway, um, there's like five more logos from this guy. And the last one I like even more, so I might change it. But yeah, I, I don't remember saying it about the color. Um, maybe send me that. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It may have been, no, I was say alcohol induced, but I honestly don't drink. I don't drink, so I'm trying to look for a good excuse. It's Phil's fault. Yeah, yeah. yeah sorry. Uh, so, Dennis, this actually might be a little bit more of a question for Chris, but just in general, so cybersecurity is something that's near and dear to my heart. I know we had a conversation about it a little bit last night, but especially with the addition of uh, Dr. Kennedy talking about, you know, because I know HIPAA is, is a big thing and it's very important to keep health information secret. So I'm wondering, what steps are you taking to secure uh, the beat apps that, that you're providing? Like, how are you ensuring that the companies that you're providing this uh, for know that their data is not going to be accessed by an unsavory app? Yeah. Um, good question. I might throw it to Craig too, but um, Optalon has great security because every time I try to join a, a meeting, I can't get in. <laughs> I send them screenshots. You know, I'm like, I'm jealous because it's, uh, it makes me re-verify myself. And um, so there's a lot of things. And, and James is our IT guy. He's based in the UK. And I, I did the easy thing. I um, had them ship me an Alphalon laptop, so I don't have any more problems getting into video. Um, do you want, can you speak to any of that? Because I, I, don't, I don't know all the systems that we're using, um, but I, I can tell you, like, in terms of the data for the bridges and things, um, we haven't announced a partner, but we, we worked with a, um, I think the best way to describe them, uh, um, a very large cloud operator. I think that would work. Um, and um, they've never been hacked. Um, and their system, their, their network actually learns and, and learns about how to prevent attacks. And actually, it's a self repairing network. If you're in that field, you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, so, our, our data would be stored in the cloud. And it's, um, it's two, two sides of it the hot side and the cold side. The cold side, we record the data over years and years, and then the hot is just. Um, the, the section of um, data stores that we would actually run the VR portions and the alerts and things like that. But, um, but we, we were, I guess initially we were relying on the internet provider or cloud provider uh, that we're, we're, we're working with. And then ultimately, um, we would probably bring it in-house because we, we actually had some discussions with a data center operator um, about possibly hiring that company. Not that not we're going to, but but the thought was as well as possibly having our own data centers at some point. Um, but not something we're going to run out and start building tomorrow. Um, um, so I think, I don't know, do you know systems or? No, we just use it. We're idiots. We just plug in and right on there. So uh, James runs all that, but I, I, I know it's very secure. Again, like I got to say, um, because we get 
like any uh, email on, so, so obviously I'm, I'm the chairman of our health one, we get the email alert. If it's not from an intercompany thing, you're, you're alerted right away and, and it does not its own analysis. But what the system is, yeah, I have no idea. So, and I'm not embarrassed to say that. I mean, first of all, the fact you can't get into his emails is totally worth it. Um, but um, I mean, from our point of view, with regards to cyber security, we're very much dependent on kind of customer requirements. Um, it, it's it's probably something that uh, internally to our time we, we, we need to get um, more involved in. That's definitely a growth model for us to so actually understanding what it is that we need to do. Um, and, and Dennis mentioned, mentioned data centers. That's one area where we're keen to explore uh, for next year in terms of actually starting to look and work closer to those guys to kind of get into the intricacies of it. So I can't sit here and say that I'm an expert in it, but I think it's a, it's a fair challenge. But um, by the same token, it's not something that, that we, we get feedback from our customers that they're, they're getting hacked or that, that, that their data isn't, isn't secure. So um, we must be doing something.
So that answer that. Yes, sir. First of all, uh, I think of all of us, uh, we want to thank you for your hospitality that you put in. <laughs> and Dennis, my question is concerning the Twin Cities project that you're working with. Uh, are you familiar with uh, uh, City Zenith? And if you are, are you working in conjunction with them? Or uh, are you a competitor of theirs? Yeah. And, and I, I, have to, I have to thank you guys because you put me in this spot right here. So it's not me, it's you. <laughs> So, um, so we know the project, but unfortunately I can't tell you whether we're working with them or not. Um, we're open to working with those types of people and projects, um, but like, I, I don't want to allude to that there might be some deal pending or something like that, um, so that they'll kind of, you know, mis could be misleading. Uh, but, but we're, we, how do I explain this? It's sometimes very difficult. Um, we're talking with a lot of different groups. Uh, in terms of bringing our tech into, into different projects. Um, and, and I'll just mention again, I know I've said this before, but the reason why we work with Caltrans is um, other department transportations generally follow their lead, they usually set standards. Uh, and um, I, I know, it, for sure, I'm positive, or pretty close to positive, I don't know what to say, where's Brian? <laughs> I'm very confident in terms of um, is the information about the system getting out there? I, I, I from my experience, it, it is because uh, DC was a perfect example uh, in terms of what groups came up and spoke with us. That they had heard about the tech. Um, the fact that we're putting together uh, a tour of the bridge with some, uh, I guess, legislators, local legislators in California actually walked on and covered this. Uh, they're going to do the virtual as well, but they will actually walk it because they want to be able to see it and uh, describe it to the constituents. So, um, so we're doing those kinds of programs, that almost like an outreach. Um, so we talk to other companies, uh, and, um, and we talk to legislators um, and help them sort of like bridge the divide because there's a big disconnect uh, between the government and industry. Uh, so you know, we're aware of like where the opportunities are, and, and we're actually building the team to do that. We just hired a couple more people. Uh, and uh, I would say Houston, that that also be somewhere around 50 people. Uh, and um, the, uh, we were, uh, Ken Evans is on now as well too, running our sales, but we're looking at building a sales team uh, up there, and we're going after the opportunities that, that we're aware of. And, and I, have to, I have to also thank a lot of you guys, because you'll send me an email with like an article or a company and say, hey, have you talked to this company? And I generally pick up a phone and I'll call them. Uh, Phil, Phil can attest to that. I have no problem picking up on a phone and call somebody out of the blue and say I'm interested in a meeting. Uh, so so we, there's the effort there, but in particular that project, we're aware of it, but I can't really say if we're working somewhere or not. It's, it's kind of like a little gray area, so I stay away from that. Yeah. But, but great, great question. Thank you. Yeah, hi Dennis. There's a lot of people here that are asking questions. Of course, SEC rules, violations, whatnot. You can't answer those questions. And I really get that. But what nobody's asking you, and I'm going to make this kind of a three part question, is one, on a scale of one to ten, how frustrated are you that you can't answer those questions? Because nobody ever asks that question. Yes, sir. And I know the answer. Yeah. Well, last night you asked me. I thought you were going to be angry, you looked angry, and you were angry because I didn't post pictures of Frank in a long time. Well, yeah, because we need proof of life, so. Yeah, proof of life. I mean, if you're if you're producing a cat, we need to know. You know, I think I was talking to you about the cat, yeah, because Phil said, what kind of cat is that? And I was like, oh, let me show you some cool pictures. And I kept scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, I didn't have any. And I realized I hadn't been home for nine weeks. So. Crazy, right? That's really crazy. Um, am I frustrated? I am because you know the, the rules are there to protect you guys, right? But 
The frustration for me is why is naked shorting allowed, right? Why are market makers who, it's not a, a, a rule, but it's, um, it's kind of like a guideline where they don't, you know, they're not handling the stock more than 10% of the holdings. Like there's, there's things put in there to protect you guys. But um, it, and again, I can't speak for the SEC, but the, the, the appearance is a lot of that goes unchecked. Occasionally they'll pluck a guy out here and there. But yeah, for me, it's very frustrating because, again, just the, the perfect example, like, you know, I'm trying to talk about any kind of shares things or, you know, I'm going to talk to a company or it, it looks like I'm avoiding the question, but the fact is I'm not. It's um, I'm avoiding any problems. Uh, and if we do have any kind of issues, it affects you guys directly. So I, I would always rather shut my mouth and say something that's in a gray area because we all know how gray areas go. It depends on who's looking at it. But yeah, it's extremely frustrating. And then one time I did say I felt like a kid, uh, you know, uh, that new old presence of Christmas, and it was only, I think I said December 10th or 11th, because I I know all the presents, I know all the presents now, but I can't convey that to you guys until you know it's publicly announced. So, but I mean that's the nature of the beast, right? Yeah. Um, so. The other part of that question is, of course you can't answer those questions now, but as soon as you can, how quickly will you? So I can tell you the regulation is some, as soon as some, something that's not related to anything, the, you know, regular course of, course of business we can talk about all day. But if it's something that um, needs an SEC filing, uh, from the time that we either sign something or the event occurred, we have, we have four business days to get that out in an 8K. Uh, and we, so that's generally what it is. When I drop the 8K, it's probably occurred four days before I dropped it. Um, so, um, I try to do it out sooner, but you know, yeah, we have four days to do it. It depends, um, depends on the bear comments as well. I don't want to really address that section, but if I could drop a press release at 2.30 p.m. when they're all starting to dump their shares, you can believe that I'll do it. <laughs> So we have a team working on that. We know how to do it, but we have to do it 
grow you rapidly so that when somebody speaks and you have a pattern, you must feed back in the drum milliseconds so it doesn't sound like an echo. So we intend to implant, um, and that's why they have been here to implant several other patients. Uh, again, we'll pay for it because that's still research. But once that is successful, then I expect that we will um, charge a certain amount, probably 100,000, for getting it done with a decent margin of 30 or 40 percent. Um, we intend to develop, I uh, already have one brain implant center that's in Belize. Um, I have a colleague who's very enthusiastic about this work, Dr. Alex Green. Actually, he's in the book, he did a comment on the book. Uh, he wants to do this as well, so that'll be a second brain implant center. And then we intend to go worldwide. We just have to get permission in each area that we have a brain implant center. So, FDA permission, European permission, the, the British will be separate from the EU, um, and other places, maybe India, maybe Cyprus, these are places where they have medical tourism. So, that is the plan right now. You might say, well, okay, so how many can you do? Well, it depends on um, the, the surgeon, as could do like three a week. Um, and then it depends on how we wait three months for the tissue to grow into the electrode and then we train the patients. So that period of several weeks or even months of uh, getting the system up and running does not require, well, I thought it did originally, it does not require one to go out to wherever they are living in the world. Because once you have a plan, they go back home and sit there waiting for the tissue to grow in, then they have somebody one you know, caregiver who would plug the system in, and then we would control and do the training from Atlanta, Georgia, where the lab is. It's actually building Atlanta, Georgia. So we see that as an efficiency. And so, in other words, within a couple of years, we expect to have revenue. Your question really isn't that. Your question is when we have profit. And that I can't answer because, well, I'm not a businessman, but I know that the more revenues we have, and we have a margin, we have to have some kind of profit. And I would anticipate that coming in the next several years. Now, I know, um, I'll tell you a little story about venture capitalists. When I realized the power of this electrode, and I realized it could be used long term for rehabilitation, all the venture capitalists said it was too early. And I thought a little bit more, it's still too early. A little bit more, this is going back over 40 years. <laughs> so, I said, okay, I'll be patient, and I'm asking you guys to be patient, but it will be done, and it will be huge. So, be patient. Thank you. So there's components that are being designed now that there's an opportunity for, for us, the Dark, dark Post Group, you know, TJM, to be able to actually build these products, right? We're, we're already working now with the company, we're building um, uh, insulin pumps, external insulin pumps, and, um, and we actually bought some equipment, we're going to expand the line, I guess, so to speak, in terms of uh, capabilities of manufacturing and attempting. We have 20 some thousand square feet in Tempe, uh, so we're updating equipment, we're going to purchase more equipment. We just added, um, well, Cody is out there somewhere. We added um, two new people in there as well. We're, we're building a sales team. Um, so so the whole manufacturing sector, is, was we're already in there and we want to build into that. So again, there's, uh, there's more opportunity in terms of generating revenue for us by working with Phil and his company. Um, and then the other part, um, both teams need an induction engineer, and Phil has somebody now, but we need another induction engineer that sort of has a dual purpose. One is to look at um, you know, different uh, battery type options for, for actually uh, running these technologies, these brain technologies. Uh, and the, the plan is in the design phase now is to put that battery inside your chest like this maker. Mine, um, mine, my dream is to make it nuclear powered. 
Phil's on the fence on that one, but that's a real Iron Man history. Right? They'd have to make it glow, I think. It's a <laughs> process. It would just be pretty badass, right? Um, but, um, so, so there's op that opportunity. And then in terms of the induction engineer, we also use them on the other side. We're looking at electric vehicle charging lanes. And I understand there's like 10 or so companies out there. I, I mentioned this in London. Um, it's a race to the top. There's no standard written yet. So it's getting the standard. And again, I, I mentioned blue ray and CD plus minus, right? Um, so all these companies are pushing forward to get to the standard, uh, and you can't patent the standard. So, uh, but the thing is, if you create the standard, your system's ready to go. If you didn't create the standard, you got to change your system to meet the standard, right? So there's an advantage to getting the standard. So that's what our focus is: is to get in the game, race to the standard, get the standard. And then start, you know, again, start expanding that type of, that part of the business, which is the smart road and the charging lane. And why I trademark those pending, they're, you know, it's a pending trademark. Uh, and, and people have asked me, like, well, there's 10 companies out there. It's a big world, and there's a ton of freaking roads out there, right? So 10 companies, that's fine by me, right? I'll take a couple million kilometers of road. That's fine. I'm not greedy, right? So, sorry, so yes, yeah, so there's a lot, actually a lot of crossover between the two of us. And then the great machine integration, um, you have to stay tuned on other things that happen in terms of ideas, and we would do that in, in dark pulse um, you know, with, with the BMI, but it's, it's really endless. And, and if you really want to get fascinated with the thing, uh, I would suggest trying to read anything you can about, you know, either HMI, human machine integration, or BMI, brain machine integration and see all the little things that can actually drop out of having that technology. Uh, and, um, and part of the joint venture, which shows the level of trust between both of us, is um, those patents are in the joint venture, right? Uh, so, uh, and you guys can read that, so it's online too, you can read some of the patents that, that Phil has created. Tons of the patent work, it's unbelievable. PCTs filed in multiple countries. Uh, so there's, there's a huge benefit to us because there's value in those patents. Uh, there's also value in the technology that's going to drop out because of those patents. So, so again, it's not today, but you have to understand we're, we're building the foundation to go forward. Um, and, um, and all those capabilities and technologies are interlinked to one another. Um, so, anyway. Um, I haven't told you guys who the manufacturer is. Um, 
I, I will at some point. The, the reason why is um, competitors as well. Um, it's not you know any particular reason other than you know it, it's it's a little bit of a timing thing, but more importantly, it's um, you know, we don't want the competitor to know what we're doing. Uh, um, like I'm a very under the radar kind of person, at least like you know market wise. Um, but um, the, there's two orders already. So and we talked about this in the lunch in a little bit too. There's, there's three flavors of the box. I think I told you that. You guys kind of know this. Um, the standard uh, box um, that needs a uh, hardware stack. And the hardware stack is our unit uh, pulse generator that makes the, the pulse of the light, um, the laser light go on and off in like nanosecond, picosecond, whatever you set it at. Uh, there's a PC, like a Dell server, an optical switch that kind of pulls all the uh, cables together and, and the, you know, the, the, the black box can go channel to channel. Basically, look at different sections of the bridge, you know, almost simultaneously. Uh, a router that connects you up to the internet. Well, you, you, right now, you know, you buy each one of those components separate, right? A Dell server. Um, there's a, a, a few different pulse generator companies as well. Um, and my, my plan is to integrate all of that into one unit so that we eliminate competitors, right? People aren't going out buying other hardware, and we're not having to buy other hardware. So um, we have 35 units um, that, for the first part of the order uh, that will have an integrated pulse generator. Uh, and that price for the pulse generator is anywhere from uh, 30 some thousand up to like 70,000 for a pulse generator. Uh, whereas with us, the straight box, uh, the market price is about 150,000. That every, every company sells them for about 150. Um, the plan is to add the pulse generator for another 20,000, so 170,000 for the unit um, to have an integrated pulse generator. So in minimum you save 10, 15,000 up to maybe 30, 40,000. And then the third version is going to have an integrated PC as well. So, so the one with everything in is going to retail somewhere around 190,000 dollars per box. The cost, so again as we ramp up with our manufacturing partner, uh, the cost of the box is going to, right now it's hovering somewhere around 15000 for the box. So still a really nice margin, 100 grand. Um, but, you know, we, Anthony and I worked on this for 13 years, Anthony for 20 some years. Um, you know, it, it'll ultimately go below 30000 uh, in terms of cost. Uh, so, so the revenues, you know, the bottom line looks a lot better. Um, then, um, uh, Maybe three years ago, we were costing out an opportunity in Mexico City, and um, I was telling the story a little while ago again. It was, it was seven million bucks, uh, and we were selling like two two units, and the rest of it was fiber optic cable. The cost of the cable, because we were using thousands of kilometers of cable, and I said to Anthony, like we're in the wrong damn business, right? We should be selling fiber cable, uh, and that's why you know. Optel came on the horizon. So, so since I would say when was that 2015 ish, um, I knew I wanted to find a fiber optic manufacturing company, and it was just a matter of like trying to find the right one and then the timing. So, um, so again, so there's 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 more margin as as well. Uh, but um, it again, it's hard to give timelines, but I can tell you that the orders been processed for 35 for initial units. Uh, and then behind that, I have 165 units as well. It's about 12 and a half million, um, in, in you know, as what we're purchasing. That's slated to go to Multinet, and Multinet is not only our distributor partner, but they're helping us build a channel partnership uh, because the way to really kind of expedite the growth is to certify other companies. So instead of us, you know, trying to sell every piece of hardware. Um, we'll have, you know, maybe a couple of dozen at first, maybe a hundred or so um, companies that are certified to put the system in. So now they're outselling, they're a certified channel partner. They buy the hardware um, from Multinet uh, and then we provision that remotely. So, so they're doing the install. Um, we would support them, either give them sales leads or they'd find their own sales lead. They would do the installation. We can offer engineering services because we have it through Optimum. We provision it, meaning we turn on the system. Uh, so we sold the unit to Multinet. They get a slight discount, only a couple of points. Um, and then they, 
they in turn allow the you know the smaller companies to buy that from them. We don't have to deal with how we're going to get you know things all over to all these different job locations. That's that logistics. And then we turn on the unit, and then we start getting the monthly revenue. And if you're familiar with Cisco Systems, the more people you add to that platform, the better your revenues look. It starts to ramp up quite quickly. Instead of just hardware, where you only as good as your last sale, right? So we have the monitoring um, that we would charge. We have warranty. We have tech support. Um, there's a whole like host of things. Licensing. So yearly license. Um, the end user would have to pay for. So now we have all these services that we're getting, uh, you know, revenue from, with extremely high profit margins. Uh, and then really, again, still very good profit margin on the on, on the hardware. So we're we're looking to kind of find another multi-net. Multi-net right now um, is about eight to twelve countries they operate in the Middle East. Uh, that's where we're going to focus. Uh, and we're um, part of the agreement with them is to to sort of like um, a showcase of the tech. And the first one will be in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and um, Multinet will invite their customers. And they have very large customers like Aramco, those that are large oil company customers, and Neon and the Line and all these these big big you know projects that are going on. We'll showcase to the to the people from those those industries and those companies uh, to help uh, you know basically help Multinet help us close deals. Uh, and then you know at the same time we'll get ready for the for the channel partnership as well too. So all that boots on the ground are kind of flying out to long. Now we fly out to long all over the place, but but again, it'll alleviate the problem of well, how do we hire 500 you know, tech people and have them on the ground? Uh, then after the project, we're probably going to pay 500 people and there's no project for you know, many months. So, so we're going to initiate the channel partner program. Uh, and like I say, Multinet's already in there. You can check them out online. There are quite a few big names like Black Box uh, and Corning distributed as well too. So and they actually do I believe they have a list of countries that they're operating in now. So hopefully that answered that. And uh Sorry, the mentor program uh, from the 
Department of Energy. So we're working with the Department of Energy to get into the mentorship program, which essentially is they have $80 billion for different infrastructure projects, and um, the plan is they want to give it to companies who have never had a Department of Energy contract. So we fit in that category. And they pair you with a company that has had a contract to help you sort of you know, navigate the waters. Uh, so we're pushing to get into that program as well, too. And that ties into a little bit in terms of we're looking at EV uh, roads. And to make it a little bit more attractive, um, to incentivize the government, uh, is where we're looking at um, the first sort of kickoff of any EV lane are in um, economically depressed neighborhoods. Uh, and that will help us attract and perhaps draw in the Department of Energy as like one of the funders uh, into the sort of power program. And I'm sorry, I forgot that deal. You had another good one too. Yes, yeah, the first one was uh, regarding kind of Q over Q revenue increase, uh, as we saw in Q2 with the over 30 active Oculon contracts. Um, are we on? Are we on pace to see Q over Q again? Um, hard question to answer. Um, it's a bit forward looking, but um, I'm trying to think how I can say this. Brian, where are you? <laughs> Brian. <laughs> Brian. The other Brian. No. Um, um, hmm. I guess it has to go, the, the safest way to describe it is, um, again, like I was saying, in terms of um, cost reductions and um, increasing sales, um, you know, ultimately lead to you know, better revenues and then you can anticipate a better bottom line, right? As you start figuring out, like how to work more closely together with all the subsidiaries. Because at first, everybody's kind of doing their own thing and you do have more expenses because things may get double. But, um, but these guys have been on fire. They've been you know, closing quite a few contracts. The things we, again, we, we shifted the focus to the one to three million dollar contract. Um, not that we wouldn't go after, you know, like, who was, I forgot how many pounds the uh, food So we have a 43 million pound contract with a major, Great operator. I say, can't, we can't say who it is because of NDA. Um, and we're not, you know, averse to those large contracts, but I, you know, you can. I, I believe you can see an increase quarter by quarter. Like we just did, we had a really nice increase. The thing, thing that kicked us in the in the butt a little bit was the um, the conversion from British pounds to U.S. Uh, so we took a hit on that, and we're actually taking steps to kind of head that as well uh, in terms of currency budget. Uh, initially, you have the ability to hedge currency just to, to kind of ease the thing to our balance sheet. And a lot of you know, big or organizations do this. Uh, and, um, and then there, you know, there's an opportunity to get into sort of forex trading kinds of things as well. You know, more appropriate in, in trading currencies as well. Um, so I, I guess it's like mitigating the risk and mitigating losses based on currencies is part of the focus. Um, but in terms of like contracts, um, again, you know, I, I sent sort of like a fuzzy picture of the system. Um, that's the manufactured ready system, and there's orders into, you know, to have these things built. Uh, and then once we get them into, you know, people's hands, um, you know, we'll see revenues generated from the system sales. Um, and um, and I also mentioned at some point, you know, back then, you know, that's one of the reasons why we bought Optimon. They have existing relationships. The tenant pipeline, particularly, is of interest because the systems are a legacy right now. They're due for upgrade in the next three years anyway. And, and we've had system failure on the pipeline. Um, they did use a competitor because we weren't even in the game yet. Um, but um, the plan is to replace those units that fail with our units and then have conversations with customers, uh, really, even through maintenance agreements, which we will sign the new maintenance agreement with town. Uh, where we can uh, install our system and deinstall competitive systems. So there's a lot of different things that, that like I said, that we're working on in terms of getting our, our hardware out there. Uh, and, um, and I think the, the, uh, the Optel acquisition is going to be a big part of that as well, too. So hopefully that answered. Yes, we had a great interview at the Smart City with that uh, young woman. Yep. Uh, what I want to know is what came out of that because I know it's city and government contractors. Yeah. What, what would be the time period? You know, it's just an estimate of dealing with, you know, like a smart city, you know, Minneapolis, you know, Chicago, whatever. But 
how long did that take to mm -hmm. respond to you got there? Because you had about three small organizations. Yeah, um, I think there was like 500 city managers there. And um, after, I, after I gave that talk, our, our booth was inundated with people. And um, we were given the, the headset, the VR headset demonstrations to everybody. And um, we, we spoke with, um, I don't think I say who, but um, a lot of US military groups, they were really interested in, um, in terms of deploying that, kind of like force protection and things like that, and situational awareness of military soldiers on the ground. So we've had those kind of discussions. I, in terms of the timeline, it's really hard to say because everybody moves at a different pace, but um, I know we made well over um, maybe a couple hundred contacts just from the university. Well, that was huge, really happy. And, um, and also like bringing those in, right, and, and establishing the timeline, who wants to go first? Um, so, um, yeah, um, it was definitely successful. I don't know how, but that was a really good interview. Actually, it was pretty funny because she had like 20 questions she wanted to ask me, and she went completely off the things. <laughs> and um, and then she caught herself, right? It's kind of funny because she's like, she looked down and I could see all the questions that she had. And I think she pulled like one question off of the sheet because she was so intrigued by it. Um, but from, but from that, um, I got two invites. One is um, Smart Cities Global. Uh, they asked me to be a keynote in uh, Barcelona. So, um, and then other Smart Cities, uh, I'll, I'll post the names of them, uh, in the UK. And um, the, first, the first one in Barcelona is in uh, November. The next one I do is April and May. I'll have a keynote there as well, too. Um, and this is we were at, had like, um, I think I had a couple of two, three thousand people. The, the ones that I go speak at have like, you know, a hundred thousand people. Because, um, but she told me, because I asked her about, oh, can we get a booth there as well? And she said, actually, the booths at this thing are not companies, they're countries. So like, this country has a booth. So, that, that's the other so yeah, thanks for asking about that. So, yeah, so we have two speaking opportunities. <coughs> so, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> Oh yeah, I do. The last time I shot this, so maybe I'll be okay. But, but um, but yeah, so so definitely more exposure. Um, and you know, I was really surprised that you see a lot of people knew who they were. They heard about they heard about that bridge. Um, so I mean that was um, yeah, we paid for it, but we saved a year, right? We we waiting for. They were willing to fund the project. We would have to wait 12 months to get approved. Um, and um, so, you know, it's a, it's a, couple hundred, well, a few hundred thousand that we put in. But, and, and I like to mention this too. Like, you know, this tech, this tech is now out in a bridge. Um, and um, once the, the bridge is completed and we cut the ribbon on, on, on you know, what we're doing, I, I can't help but think that there's, if, let's say, a bridge collapses or some sort of, you know, some sort of infrastructure, you know, issue where people are injured or have to get killed. I mean, you can't tell me there's not a litigator out there that would say, you know, it's public knowledge. This is bridge in California. Why didn't you put that tech in here? And I'm sure they'll be sending us. Right? I mean, that's what's going to so they, they'll be sending us inquiries. Like, could it have done this, that, and everything? And you know, so it gets to a point where, you know. You're almost like forced to put this life-saving technology in a piece of infrastructure because why wouldn't you? The, the cost, the percent cost, like less than five percent of the project to put it in. Uh, why would you not have it in your project, in your project, or you know, your, your bridge, let's say, can and prevent injury and death, right? So there's the liability aspect. We're actually talk, talking into the insurance industry. Um, it's, it's, it sounds a little double-edged sword because we, we would take some of that risk on as well too because we're saying, hey, we're going to let you know before there's a problem. So it's, a, it's on us, right? Um, but at the same time, you know, I would imagine, and you know, the, it, you know it's a finicky type of industry, but I would imagine that if they can, if they can move risk on to us versus the insurance company, it's a reduction in rate that would have to occur at right, some point. So, so that is the plan, and, and, and we, we have been talking to different groups, um, even our own insurance providers, and um, it's probably not something that would happen overnight, but I 
think it's, it's something, it makes sense, right? If you're an insurance company and you have a company that says, we can, we can tell you if something's going to happen, wouldn't you rather push that off onto them and go, because we just limited our risk exposure? I mean, it comes down to profits again, too, but perhaps, depending, that they would actually lower, lower their rates, right? Because, you know, again, we're mitigating their risk as well, too. So, so yeah, there, I mean, there's like so many aspects of this thing, so many opportunities to bring revenue. Um, I, 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 in terms of the tech, I, I joke and say it's a dessert topping and a floor wax, right? Because it kind of can do so many different things. And um, it took me a long time to fully wrap my head around it because every time I asked Anthony, hey, can we put it in here? He's like, yes. Then I took what I thought were the parameters because it was installed in a certain thing. And then I would ask you about something else. He's like, yes. And I was like, okay, how can that be? You know, when you said you could do it, these parameters. Well, the parameters are wider than the question you asked me. Uh, so then I realized the kind of medium, uh, it could be attached to steel, it could be carbon fiber, it could be attached to wood in cement, uh, in blacktop, or in buildings, aircraft wings, helicopter blades, um, you know, foundations of wind, wind towers, wind farms, right? In the blades of wind farms, um, in fiber optic communications cables across the ocean, the same deterioration of fiber or something cut the fiber. So just like continually, you know, the market is huge, but you know, it's, it's more narrow focus. And I'm like to say right now, it's um, it's bridge infrastructure and oil and gas pipeline. That's, that's where we're really focusing. And then the other ancillary technologies and capabilities like what Phil's doing, come in later and actually enhance what Another two questions, thanks. Was a little echo. I couldn't hear. I'm sorry. 
Okay, no worries. Iron Mountain. Yeah, yeah. So I'm a military pilot. She's a maritime officer. We're very interested in the technology and specifically if you can view this real time as an operator while you're underway or if you're airborne or if this is something that has to be downloaded once you're back in maintenance. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, um, it would be a real time application. That's, that's what we're pushing in. Um, so, in, again, the cool thing, um, most, most aircraft uh, components are going to carbon fiber. Um, and um, we can do like a full end to end. So, when it's in the, the oven being baked, is the way I describe it, um, we, can, um, we can give them real time temperature. And temperature lets them know if they're bonded correctly. And we can also give them, um, you know, if there's voids and pockets in there. Right now, they do a, what they call a tap test. Are you familiar with that? Yes. Yeah. They basically tap on a panel with a quarter and listen to what they hear, hear the change in sound and find a void. That, that blew my mind. When yeah. you, talk to, you talk to a company that builds panels for like Huey helicopters and they do a tap test. And I was like, okay, that's, that's a little primitive. But, um, so, so you have the fiber embedded. We, we basically watch it go through the autoclave. Um, you cut out, you know, an analog and helicopter blade, whatever it is. Um, you put it into service. The system can be plugged into that because the fiber's already in there. Uh, and then we basically turn it on. We can show stress, strain, temperature in real time. Uh, and then the other kind of interesting thing, if there's any more of those sort of incidents we had in the past where transponders were turned off or what have you, we can at least tell you where the, we can tell you where the plane is dependent, like on what component, where the plane is located globally. Uh, because of the, the fact that it's all cloud-based as well, too. Um, I was trying to think what else I was going to tell you guys on that. Um, oh, it reminded me, um, one of the other flavors of boxes is aerospace. Uh, and um, it's coming out of a separate part of the United States. Um, so we're looking at new configurations. So look, right now, the three flavors of box uh, are rack mountable, so that, you know, they're, they're about a 3U, uh, so about eh, four inches, let's say. Um, and then, you know, by they slide into the rack. Um, the aviation one has a different configuration to go into a panel. So go to a, a, either an aircraft panel or, you know, um, uh, you know uh, as I say, spacecraft, I guess is the best way to say it. So it actually fits in the panels. Um, so, so that might end up being organized as well, too. I talked to somebody yesterday from NASA that's here. I went, I went out here. Um, but we talked about the shape test, the vibration test. Uh, so that's that. That design is in process. Once we build the first prototype, it, we go to the NASA's uh, Jet Propulsion Lab. We strap it in. And I've been to these things in the past, and you see bits and pieces go flying off all over the place because they, they vibrate this thing to simulate, um, you know, launch. Uh, so so we'll do that. And once we go to that certification, we'll let the aviation uh, section also are uh, ready to go. And in that instance, we're looking at the um, same thing. Um, we can do um, carbon fiber fuel tanks. We can, um, you know, basically, you know, take those through monitoring. We just had a problem on the launch pad a couple of weeks back with it a few week. Uh, our system could have detected that. Uh, and then also um, these smart sauna tubes. There's just various things. Um, SpaceX uses these uh, 10 inch, um, 10 inch, I think, by 10 or 12 feet long sauna tubes. Uh, and there's um, an issue with weight. Only 2% of um, a rocket's um, total weight, I guess, is usable. So there's 2% of payload. So a lot of the components they use are reinforced carbon fiber, which are very heavy. So the plan is to create a product line and work you know, hand in hand with a company like SpaceX, where we can do these smart um, components, solid tubes in particular, and reduce the weight and perhaps increase it by 1 or 2% payload. And you're talking, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in extra revenues per launch because launches are expensive. Uh, so that's the plan there as well too. So we'll have the aviation part. Thanks for bringing it up. Aerospace and aviation one, uh, which is just a weaponized uh, version as well. And did I answer all your questions? I think so, sir. One final question. Uh, are those components, are they heat resistant too? Can you integrate them into engines? That's usually what happens versus a wing falling off. Yeah. Um, the, the units themselves have various operating ranges, um, and um, it's kind of the same thing with the aerospace. It's um, it's a different world, which I, I know you know, all the way down to the solder that we use in the components. So I, I don't have the temperature range right now, but we can definitely, um, we can give you an idea of what that is. But yeah, just like, what's the range? 
you know, inside of, uh, of a spacecraft and then same thing uh, in, like, again, it's going to be in the cockpit of an airplane, so, um, so whatever, whatever the requirement is, that's what we're building to. Um, is that cool? Yeah, and the current uh, company we're working with in terms of manufacturing, we're working on that design with us as well. And, and I do also want to mention, part of the process that we're doing with them, um, through TJM, we'll build a lot of the surfboards, and, um, uh, and basically, I almost said the company again too, it's hard not to say their name. Um, basically, they, they give us a purchase order, we create the, um, the surfboards, they pay TJM for building cash surfboards, and then, um, then we're obviously paying for, for units, so it's kind of keeping it in the family a little bit. So, um, but anyway, yeah. hopefully I can answer that question. <coughs> Um, I guess I'll do the QB thing. Um, at, at that point, um, the, uh, the OTC was going through a lot of changes. Um, and a lot of people actually left uh, the OTC that worked, that they worked for um, you know, OTC markets. And the delay kept dragging on and dragging on and dragging on. And um, the cost structure to do it started changing. Even now, um, we didn't pay for have a stock listed uh, OTC. Now you, you have to pay a inflated uh, fee. I can't remember, it was like 7000 if I'm right. And um, I was just getting more and more frustrated with uh, like what was happening to, the, to everybody's stocks in the OTC. And I decided between the timelines and the cost, um, I, I just felt like there were bigger markets. For it. <coughs> and, um, and that's why I started talking about you know, how the plan is to list a major exchange. And it just made sense. Um, so the focus shifted towards getting the company ready to get to a major exchange. Uh, and uh, so, you know, that's the focus now as well to, to get us out of the OTC. Yeah. Oh, and you asked about the board thing. Um, that's a political football. So there's a lot of green light, red light, Green light, red light, uh, and um, but uh, a couple few weeks back, uh, you'll notice um, the government um, in, uh, finally decided that you know you needed technology to, to go along the border. So they're at least changed their thinking now. Rather than a fence that everybody's climbing and digging on the heat, they're turning towards the technology. And um, you know, when the call comes, if it comes, we're, we're ready. The system can do exactly what we had said. Tell the detection and tell you know people walking on the board. Uh, so, so you know we hope you know all of a sudden now Mexico's paying for the border wall. Um, I'm <laughs> fairly certain that's not going to happen. <laughs> but um, but yeah we yeah you know, we still we're working towards that towards that end to get um, you know not even border um, but we um, we're looking at an opportunity in the Middle East to um, do a perimeter of an airport. Um, so there's definitely interest in that. And then also some border opportunity uh, along the Libya and Egyptian border as well that we were in discussions with the company too. And, and how we would do that. I don't remember. I think it's 5,000 kilometers of the border that they're looking at. So definitely interest. Um, and yeah, as soon as you get anything that's you know more solid, like you know, maybe a partnership or a joint venture around doing some permanent things in Egypt, we can we'll drop some out. Um, so there, there are other versions, and I posted images of them 
on, uh, on Twitter. Um, so the first one is it's more like a gamer type of look, um, but it's actually pretty cool because um, we have this, it looks like an ice crystal sphere that you can grow. Uh, it's large enough that you actually stand inside of it, but um, when I was a kid I had a face mask that I, I used to stick in the water and actually be able to look and see the fish moving by because I was too afraid to put my face in the water. So it's kind of like that where you take this sphere and you can push it against the different you know, parts of the bridge and actually see into the bridge which makes it um, transparent. Um, the next version you'll see is more like, looks a bit more skeletal. Um, and um, I guess the coolest part, and we had really good feedback um, from um, someone who was a mayor of a certain city that was at the DC convention. And um, their, their comment was, the fact um, that they're not a numbers person, they're not an engineer. Craig's an engine, is an engineer. Um, they like the fact that like anybody can put on this headset and see what's going on, right? And you guys will see it um, tomorrow. We'll, we'll, we'll do a demo for you guys. You can put on the headset, walk down coverage. Um, and um, right now, when you look at the alerts, there are various colors, you know, depending on the stress and strain. But it's all, it's all, it's like basically 2D. Um, and uh, the next version, when it comes out, it'll, um, it'll have uh, force vectors. So you'll see the direction and the, and the, and the, how strong the force is on that bridge. So rather than just a, a red blotch on the roadbed, you'll see what direction it is. So it gives you uh, vectors. Um, so that, we're hoping, I don't want to, Chris is here. We're going to do it in two weeks, Chris. We're already, Chris is calling me crazy. There he is. Oh, five days, Chris? No. It's gonna, it's gonna be it's gonna be a couple of weeks. We'll, we'll launch, uh, launch the next one. You guys will understand the answer better tomorrow when you put on the mirror and set, and you'll see like the alerts. Um, look at the picture I put on Twitter. That's like a screen grab from the, the next thing we're working on. We'll, we'll hope to launch that fairly quickly behind it. Um, but it's kind of cool, and you'll see it. You, they'll give you a little bit of like. A, Construction, but there's different tools that you have on your hands. Um, and we're not going to use the hand gesture thing, we're going to have the controls. It's a little easier than trying to teach you the different things you do here that will bring up based on what your hands are doing. But you'll, you'll, you'll see, you'll push this button, you'll bring up a little menu, and then you can choose what you'd like. You bring up that sphere that you can zoom in on, um, or um, you can bring up a data table. So there's this table in front of you that will give you the you know, the, the math part of it, the numbers, uh, what's going on, stress and strain. Uh, and then you can also type in notes on that and you can send it back to, you know, your headquarters, we'll call it. Um, but you guys will see it tomorrow, and then the next version will come out fairly soon. Um, I'll give you Chris's email, and if it's not fast enough for you guys, you can just start emailing it every single day. So Chris, they, no, okay. can you imagine? So yeah, it should be out soon. <laughs> Uh, and then the other component was um, 
they signed the contract to give us, um, you know, basically an exclusive on, um, yeah, you know, I guess integration is what was in the contract. So, um, so again, we're waiting kind of on the list of what do they want us to do in terms of the integration. Uh, because there's semen systems going in there as well too, and it's um, basically building your user interface. Um, and then also part of that is uh, hospitality park, where um, I guess the requirements that you know they have in terms of uh, the hospitality side is the ability to you know unlock your door without using a key to use facial recognition, uh, and then also to track um, their purchases at the hotel. And be able to pay like for a meal with facial recognition as well too. So totally cashless, don't have to carry like, carry your wallet kind of scenario. Um, and again, we're just kind of waiting on the scope. Like how far do you want to go with that? But like I can tell you, the three the three sections are basically pulling this. Um, it would be a stainless steel jacketed fiber for temperature and air temperature and airflow. Uh, it would be um, you know creating a one user interface, I guess, because. You know, you don't want like multiple screens with multiple systems, so it's integrating our system with senior systems. Uh, then the last part is the hospitality part. Uh, so, um, I mean, personally, I like everything yesterday, but um, I think from their point of view, they're they're on track. Um, we were just waiting some for more documents from uh, Siemens in terms of, um, you know, what what do they want next? Uh, it, I was going to say oddly, but not so much oddly, but they, they're starting in the retail portions of the resort. And um, I mean, it's just my, my opinion is, uh, is to start in sort of the hotel room portions. Uh, but, you know, it's the way the customer wants to run, like how they want it to deploy it. So, so right now it's in a, it focuses on the retail portions. Maybe it's something, I don't know, they're going to want to turn those on first, which would make sense, because that's a profit center. And then kind of go from there. But I know there's a couple of buildings still that they they're still under construction. Some completed, I completed. I say tight to the weather. Uh, and then like I say, the retail portion seem like that's their focus. So, but yeah, as soon as we hear back from that, um, you know, I'll definitely give you guys an update. But it's, it's really really hard. Even like the bridge, really really difficult to say. You know, it's going to be done by this date. They, I think they gave us an estimate on the bridge like, like the end of December. Um, but we're just a subcontractor. And the same thing with Moonland, we're a subcontractor, we're just waiting for, hey, we need this next, and that's uh, kind of what we've been doing it even on the bridge. Actually, the bridge can give us you know, heads up sometimes. Uh, like Carl's just there for way more days than he had anticipated because their schedule increased very quickly, and we had to stay on site uh, to, to kind of keep on top of, uh, like, always, like, not. You've got to drag in your feet, so anyway. But yeah, we'll give you an update as soon as we get the next update from Mumla. Uh, from Any others? Okay, I guess we're out of time. So, um, you want to tell them, I guess, about it, uh, right? But anyway, I just want to thank all you guys, and, um, <coughs> and I appreciate Phil coming out. It's his first time in Vegas. So, so you know what that means, right? Shots on Phil. He'll be, he'll be at the bar there. He's got the correct part. And, and, and also thank uh, Craig here. When, um, it's not easy working with me. Uh, Phil, for Phil it is, because he's just as much of a driver as me. Um, but uh, Craig will tell you, if he doesn't answer in five minutes, um, I'm on the phone. Like, what the hell's going on? He's like, I'm on the train going home. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. forgot it was 8 o'clock at night. But anyway, and, and I used to text these guys at 2 o'clock in the morning. They're like, these guys not answering. I'm like, oh, crap, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. And, but Joe Panolino learned to turn his phone off. Uh, so I try not to do that. And I even told you guys mute me because I, I used to. You know, put two tweets at three o'clock in the morning, so I try not to do that anymore either. But uh, unfortunately, you know, welcome to my, my life. So I want to talk to you. Well, thank you, Greg, and Phil, and Dennis.